Hello, welcome back. Today we have our second lecture, our crash course on American government for my IB history classes. Uh, today we are going to be taking a look at two of the major branches, uh, the legislative branch, which is included in Article 1, and the executive branch, which uh, of course is headed up by the president and is in Article 2. Now last time we met we talked about some of the, uh, the, the philosophies that ultimately led us to this style of governance, um, but we also did discuss uh, some of the issues uh, that were problematic of the, the Articles of Confederation, and then we, the, we ended by them getting together in Philadelphia to actually write the Constitution itself. There were a number of compromises that were made uh, to, that led them to the, uh, uh, the writing of the Constitution. Today we're going to talk about what they actually put in the Constitution. So the day has come, they are discussing uh, you know, what should this government, how it should be framed out, and exactly what it should look like. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into the lecture itself. And like I said, we are going to begin here with uh, the, the writing of the Constitution, the framework. Uh, how is this all set up? Well, the, uh, the, some numbers here, um, and uh, it's good to know because uh, the, this is going to be a reference point, but uh, the Constitution itself is written in 1787. The ratification process, basically each state would have to approve the Constitution, uh, began the following year, 1788, and then they had enough states ratify it that it did take effect in 1789. The Bill of Rights that we mentioned at the end of our last lecture would come two years later in 1791, and they are the first 10 amendments to the Constitution. So uh, it's an amazing document. It's not perfect, um, but it allows for enough flexibility that uh, people can change it and, you know, when it is necessary and sometimes when it's not. We'll talk about things like prohibition. Um, uh, so anyways, the, uh, the, the Constitution, you know, it is not a miraculous document, um, but it is one that took, uh, you know, some of our greatest minds and thinkers of the age. Uh, this is what they came up with. And, and like I said, it, it was rigid enough to where uh, they could enforce the laws, but it was flexible enough that uh, laws could change if they needed to. And uh, given time and, and social norms, uh, eventually that was necessary. So, um, you know, uh, again, I, I look at this, uh, this period as um, uh, you know, a unique time in human history. Well, what, what they're doing here, what this Constitution outlines is um, uh, one of the, the most solid foundations of government we've ever seen in world history. And that's, that's really undeniable. Uh, the fact that, you know, here we are 240 years after uh, this date, and we are still, um, you know, we are still using this same constitution. That's uh, that's a pretty amazing feat. So I think we should we should honor that. All right. Well, let's talk about the uh, the breakdown uh, as to, to what was in the constitution, what it is in the constitution. Uh, Article one, as I mentioned, the legislative branch, the main goal. And again, this this kind of basic information will absolutely be on your test. You got to know it, study it, learn it, memorize it. Article one, legislative branch. Uh, they are the ones that make the laws. They write the laws. Um, they, uh, you know, this article will go into, uh, the requirements for Congress, like what, you know, age requirements and, you know, um, what requirements are, um, are made on, on congressmen, uh, themselves. Uh, it includes things like the elastic clause, which, uh, basically allows for us to, we'll, we'll talk about this later on. Um, but, uh, you know, basically gives some flexibility to Congress to make laws that, were needed. Um, again, you had guys like Madison that said everything's going to be so defined in the Constitution that government won't be able to work outside of that. Well, there needed to be some flexibility, um, you know, uh, that, that would allow for them to do things that weren't thought about at that time. Um, but this is where uh, uh, you also see even forbidden powers uh, in Article 1, uh, where they say that Congress cannot, so very specifically mentioning that they shall not have the ability to do certain things. So, you know, we'll, we'll define it later on, what things that are what we call enumerated versus, um, uh, you know, that are written down. So uh, a lot of these terms we'll, we'll come back to later. Article 2, you need to know this one. Uh, the Article 2, the second, is about the executive branch. And by the way, I think they, they did this absolutely, uh, you know, on purpose. 
they did believe that Article I, uh, that the legislative branch needed to come first because in their mind, it was the most important branch. This is where the work was being done. This is where the laws were being made. This is where the people were truly represented. All right? They put the executive branch, the president, in Article II because they did believe in limiting the power of the executive, um, and they wanted uh, a singular president to take a back seat to Congress. Uh, they thought that Congress should be the most powerful entity in American government. And uh, I think uh, students of history understand that uh, throughout, throughout time, uh, executive branches tend to expand and hardly ever contract. And that would be the case even in our own system. Um, for instance, the power to declare war. Congress is the only one to, that has the power to declare war. But yet, how many wars have we fought that have been declared by presidents that, uh, you know, they may not officially declare war, but they put boots on the ground. And boy, a lot of people are sure dying that make it look like a war. So uh, we've seen the betrayal of some of these these uh, ideas from uh, from this this first generation of Americans. But the executive branch uh, executive executes. They are the ones that enforce uh, the laws and again, headed up by the president. But it's a pyramid. It, everybody below that vice president, attorney general, all the way down to, um, you know, frankly, uh, anyone that's enforcing the laws. Um, so, you know, even at a, a more localized uh, level. Um, this uh, the the article itself goes into a lot more detail, you know, uh, outlines the duties of the president, of the vice president, uh, puts in there the terms of the office. Um, you know, and one interesting note is that uh, today we all know, of course, the president has two term limits. Uh, there's a two term limit. Um, that was not always the case. And uh, FDR, for instance, would be elected four separate times. Um, but eventually uh, it was decided that term limits um, did need to put in, be put in place, and, and so that, that was the case. Um, the reason that nobody had served more than two was because of, frankly, tradition that George Washington um, stepped down voluntarily after two years and allowed, or excuse me, two terms, and allowed for a peaceful transition of power. And uh, that was a tradition that was followed all the way up to FDR. And, uh, you know, before we're critical of FDR for that decision, you have to remember we were in the midst of a very... Uh, two very important crises at that time, the Great Depression, of course, but also by the time the third term rolls around, World War II is starting to break out across the world. Tensions across the globe are starting to break out. And um, although America wasn't in that war yet, um, we very quickly would be. So FDR was a strong leader that um, um, basically the, the people supported for a third term, breaking tradition. Article 3 uh, deals with um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm looking at my notes now. Uh, there's also things in Article 2, like uh, succession, like who would take over after the president, uh, if the president died, um, the uh, the outline for impeachment. Uh, we've just gone through an impeachment trial um, with, with President Trump, um, in which the House did vote to impeach him. Of course, the Senate did not, so he kept his job, but uh, officially he was impeached. Um, he was found basically guilty of uh, committing this violation of, of a norm. Uh, so anyways, um, the, uh, the oath of office is outlined in Article 2, uh, and very specific uh, executive powers are also outlined there as well. Article 3, the judicial branch. They are the ones that interpret the law. So, uh, you know, in court trials, you have a violation of the law and, uh, you know, you have a person's day in court where they're allowed to defend uh, themselves and going through due process. But the court has to decide whether that person actually did break the law. Um, and that is an interpretation of uh, not only the Constitution, but also uh, local law. So, um, you know, this is this addresses, you know, how much power the judicial branch and judicial branch has changed quite a bit, even after this this constitutional era. Uh, it was the by far the weakest branch. Um, we're going to see Justice John Marshall really rise up and uh, um, frankly, kind of grant powers himself to the courts on their ability to decide things like unconstitutionality. And um, uh, that will tr forever affect uh, the, the power of that, that judicial branch. We'll get there later on. It does outline uh, the, the ultimate court, the Supreme Court, but also um, some of the lower courts as well. And interesting note, it also is the article in which we define the term treason. And uh, 
you know, of course, treason was a much bigger deal, I guess, back then, um, you know, for people that would have been acting uh, against the state, against the government. And, uh, um, of course, coming out of the revolution, ten, less than 10 years after, um, you know, these men were, were concerned about that. So uh, they included it uh, as well. Uh, defining the other articles, you have Article 4, which uh, talks about the states and uh, the union itself, kind of the nature of the union. It defines uh, how states kind of fit into this plan. So the Constitution forms a federal government, but you still have states and you still have state governments. How does that all work together? Um, so that is what is defined in Article 4. So Article 4, the states. Um, it also d discusses how to form new states. You know, there's a lot of land out west that they, uh, they you know, a lot of territory that they did plan to make into states eventually, and uh, they needed to have a plan. What, what is the legal requirement to become a new state? And we'll, we'll cover that later on. Uh, Article 5 deals with how to amend the Constitution, to how to get rid of something in the Constitution or to add something to the Constitution. Um, so Article 5 is about amendments. Article 6 uh, defines the Constitution as the supreme law of the land. Um, and, uh, you know, that that was uh, that's going to, again, come into effect uh, when we get towards the Civil War, that ultimately authority of the government lies in the Constitution. And uh, regardless of local laws, regardless of state laws, that the Constitution is the supreme law. It is the end piece. It is the uh, the top law in the land. And uh, if a state does not conform to the Constitution, then the state is wrong. Uh, Article 7, ratifying procedure. It explained how the Constitution should be legally ratified. And of course, as we know, it was ratified in 1789, uh, took effect. Um, so, uh, again, just some legalism there as to, to how we actually, um, you know, defined how we got this in place. Uh, let's take a look at uh, some of the amendments. And uh, again, an amendment, you, you definitely need to know this, is a change or addition to the Constitution. Uh, within the first two years, the Bill of Rights was added, first 10 amendments to the Constitution. Uh, we're going to briefly go through those. It is a good idea to know these for your exam. I know it's a lot, but uh, um, it's, it's not only a good idea to know these for an exam, but also a good idea to know these as an American citizen, because uh, you may one day be leaning on these rights um, uh, to defend yourself. Hopefully, that is not the case, being all good uh, law-abiding citizens, but uh, sometimes even innocent people have to uh, defend themselves. First Amendment. The freedom of religion, speech, press, assembly, petition. They loaded this first one up for a reason. Uh, they, they put all of this first. Uh, the freedom of religion. Of course, the United States, many of the states were founded by religious groups that uh, came to America to escape persecution. Um, so the idea of freedom of religion, not freedom from religion. Um, I think today sometimes we've uh, gotten to the point where we argue that we shouldn't have any religious influence anywhere in society. That's not the case. We have freedom of religion. You can choose to practice a religion or not. Um, you are not compelled to uh, to practice a religion, nor should the government uh, adhere to a singular religion. Um, it needs to remain secular, and that, that, is, that was the belief at the time and um, remains so today. Uh, speech, freedom of speech, that you have the right to say what you want uh, within limits. And I, I do want to mention uh, there are limitations to all these, okay? There are limitations. This is not not, um, these are not rights that just extend forever. You do not have the freedom to say whatever you want. Um, the, the law has stated that there are limits to speech, um, especially when that speech involves inciting violence. Okay. Um, you know, we, we talk about how hate speech, um, you know, incites violence. So, uh, it is not all encompassing. There are limits, and I'm, I'm going to talk about that in the Second Amendment as well. There are limits to the right to bear arms, and we, you know, none of these are uh, completely just, you know, open for uh, uh, complete. You know, uh, uh, you do not have the right to say whatever you want. Um, moving on, the, the freedom of the press. Uh, the, the press should be able to operate without. Um, influence from the government. The press should be able to operate uh, without being shut down. That is going to be challenged right away. In fact, John Adams would, um, would, would be very critical of the press and frankly made it illegal to criticize the government. Just a terrible, terrible law. Um, but why these Bill of Rights became so important so quickly, 
freedom of assembly, the freedom to, to be able to assemble together in uh, small or large groups. Um, and, uh, you know, right now I'm recording this in the middle of this uh, pandemic uh, in 2020. And, um, you know, that is that is a, a right that has been challenged. And, um, you know, it, it again, it goes back to my first lecture on this, that the government constantly has a job to do a balancing rights and security. Right. So we're at a time where this this virus is spreading like wildfire. It is spreading quite rapidly. Um, should the government had the, the right to limit assembly to try and uh, do what's best for uh, to make society secure? Well, that, that's a great debate. And I, I'm not here to give you the answer, but I'm just saying that these these are the things that that we're still debating today. But, um, uh, you know, luckily, these freedoms were established. Um, uh, and again, I, I would apply the limitations to assembly as well. Um, uh, there, that's going to be proven over and again. I mean, um, this is not this does not apply to uh, uh, again, uh, the, the laws can limit these. So uh, in, in some states and in fact, um, I believe the Supreme Court has, has said that there is it is lawful to limit uh, sizes uh, within place. I mean, you have things like fire codes, right? I mean, that's a limitation on assembly. So uh, there are limitations uh, in the best interest of security and safety. Um, the right to petition. OK, uh, you could call up your senator representative, tell him you he's doing a terrible job. Um, you have that right. You have the right to petition your government for changes. You have the right to actually go out, get signatures, get something changed, put on a ballot. Um, you know, not every person, not every state uh, has that uh, that that right and that freedom. Um, it's a very important one to to criticize our government. We should we should always keep them to a very high regard. Um, but we should also be very critical when uh, when we think that they are acting outside the law or not in the best interests of uh, every American. The Second Amendment, perhaps the, the most debatable of all amendments, the right to bear arms. Uh, there's my dad joke at the bottom uh, with the actual bear arms. I know. I'm sorry. Um, so the uh, the right to bear arms, um, you know, should, you know, again, the, the the wording at the time, part of what makes this so debated is, uh, you know, the wording at the time says, that this this amendment really is in reference to the formation of state militias, um, you know, in in the purpose of you know uh, having a well regulated state militia um, that uh, people have the right to bear arms. But uh, you know, again, I'm not going to go into detail about this because again, I, my my goal is not to try and sway you towards one side. But uh, I will remind you that there are limitations to our ability to bear arms. Um, for instance, you cannot own a tank, right? Uh, you know, there, there's, uh, there's certain arms that uh, the government has decided, uh, military weapons that are, are too dangerous. You cannot own a nuclear bomb, okay? So there are limitations, and we argue as to what those limitations should be. And I think more, more current modern argument is, especially military-style assault weapons, uh, you know, automatic rifles, is that something that, um, you know, the, the founding fathers would have said is something our that should be defined here as our, uh, as our right to own. And again, I'm not being critical of that. I'm, I'm saying it's worthy of discussion. Um, you know, understanding that there are limitations, um, uh, but, but yet, uh, you know, there should be, I, I think we always probably err on the side of, of more freedom versus more security, but, um, um, it, it comes at a cost sometimes. Um, you know, our, our society has, uh, more mass shootings than any other nation on earth. And we also have more guns than anybody on earth. I mean, those two things are, are completely linked together. So, um, you know, there's a reason the Second Amendment is so debated um, and uh, rightfully so. I think each and every person has to make up their own mind on what they're willing to accept as to what should be legal in terms of weaponry. And um, again, I, I'm not here to explain what that should be. That's something you need to decide on your own. The third uh, deals with something we saw a little bit of in the, the revolution or at least the, the fear of, and that was the quartering of soldiers. Um, so third specifically denies uh, the, the ability of soldiers to, to be housed in, in one's home. Um, so no quartering. That's a direct result of, of uh, you know, some of those laws we saw passed by the British government uh, at the beginning of the revolution. The Fourth Amendment, very, 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 very important. Um, the Fourth Amendment deals with um, due process, but also reasonable search and, uh, search and seizure. Um, 
you know, you, there is a process that must be followed in the law. You know, when you are arrested, you know, now you have to be read your rights, your Miranda rights. Um, but uh, ultimately, you, you know, you, you're supposed to have your day in court uh, within a um, uh, an appropriate time frame. You know, you hear about some of these people that are held for months on end without having uh, a day in court to uh, express their, their innocence. Um, that is wrong. That, that is, should be denied by uh, the Fourth Amendment. But uh, this also incorporates, you know, search and seizure, you know, what rights the government has to go in onto your own property and to to take things or to arrest you. Um, so that is one that is also highly debated uh, and is often used, um, especially as defense in criminal cases. The Fifth Amendment is interesting. The, uh, the idea that you cannot be tried without a grand jury indictment or punished twice for the same offense. This is, is referred to often as double jeopardy. So um, this, uh, this cannot be, you cannot be a witness against yourself. And again, guaranteeing uh, due process as well. Um, the, uh, this idea of double jeopardy, you cannot be tried for murder twice. You know, the, the spirit of the law says, uh, you know, this is to protect the innocent. You know, if somebody is, uh, you know, they're going after somebody for a murder and they're found innocent, they can't come back a year later and try them again, just, you know, waiting for that moment where they finally get them. Um, but this, this does allow for, uh, violations at, at times. I mean, um, frankly, the, the, the case that comes to mind is, uh, the case of Emmett Till. Uh, you might remember this from your American history, but, uh, young, young boy, uh, African-American boy from Illinois who went to Mississippi to visit his cousins over one summer was brutally murdered, tortured, killed. And uh, the two men, of course, were found uh, that had committed the, the crime, uh, were found not guilty by an all-white jury there in Alabama. Um, and uh, uh, the, uh, the, the two men that committed the crime because they had been found innocent and they knew they were protected by the Fifth Amendment, they could not be found guilty of that crime in the future. They ended up admitting to it after the after the trial, and uh, you know, oh, it's just so despicable. But uh, um, you know, ultimately, again, there's this this protection was put in place to try and uh, protect the innocent. Um, I had a professor tell me one time, and this is a famous quote, but uh, that you know, our 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 system is designed to allow you know ten ten uh, guilty men to go free to try and protect one innocent man from going to prison. Um, now, I think that requires some clarification. There are, of course, innocent people in, in prison. Uh, it is not a perfect system. But I think this is an example of what, what that quote is, is pushing for. Um, because sometimes uh, we, we do have to err on the side of, um, uh, you know, reasonable doubt or, you know, the fact is that, uh, um, you know, it, it's better to decide where you may be wrong and find the person innocent versus finding them guilty and, and being wrong. Does that make sense? So, uh, you know, it's much better to let an innocent man, um, you know, go free, uh, or excuse me, it's much better to have a guilty man go free than it is to have an innocent man in, in, in jail. That's kind of the ultimate purpose of this. So, uh, sorry, I'm confusing myself with this. <laughs> okay, the Sixth Amendment. Uh, let's talk about the uh, the right of accused in criminal cases. You have the right to um, face your accuser. Uh, you have the right to defend oneself. Uh, Art uh, Amendment number seven, trial by jury. You have the right to be tried by jury of your peers. I'll remind you that in the American Revolution, you know, they uh, the, the British had actually passed a law saying that if you were found, uh, well, if you were arrested for a crime, you could be shipped back to England to be tried. Well, they didn't consider that their peers. Uh, so this is directly a result of that. Uh, number eight, no excessive bail or cruel punishment. Um, cannot torture prisoners. Um, the Ninth Amendment uh, says that citizens do retain, and again, this is what the uh, uh, the Anti-Federalists feared, but uh, they, they made sure this was in there. Ninth says that citizens retain rights not listed in the Constitution. So protecting the idea that just because we didn't write it down doesn't mean it doesn't protect us. Okay, um, And then the tenth, power not given to the federal government is given to the people and states. That's an important one, very important one, because uh, power is not given to the federal government. It's given to people and states. So things not included in the Constitution are going to be passed down and the states are going to be allowed to... Uh, um, you know, they're, they're going to be, have the right to define that however they want. So things like education, right? The federal government is not in the business of, of education, which 
they shouldn't be, but often they are. Um, that is a power passed down to the states, policing, things like that. So uh, power is not given to the federal government, given to the people and states. All right, we, uh, we are going to transition to the first article, and uh, today we're just going to cover the legislative branch. We're going to talk about how a bill becomes a law, and um, the, uh, the legislative branch itself, um, well, I'll tell you what. I'm going to pause there. I'm going to decide not to go on. Last last lecture, I went pretty heavy. This lecture, I'm going to pause, and we're going to make this a whole separate lecture. So I uh, apologize. You're going to have to do another click, watch another video, but I um, um, wanted to, to cover at least the amendments and that whole process before we get into the article. So we'll uh, we'll make a whole separate video on the, uh, the actual articles and, and the legislative branch itself. Thanks for tuning in, and uh, let me know if you have any questions.